Good evening, Adeleke. How are you today? Good evening, Roche White. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Yomi Adedeji, good evening. Ojokwe Lume, good evening. Adaora IJ, good evening. Ngozi, evening. Volka, good evening. Adeola Disu, good evening. Patti, good evening. Ola Niyi, Ola Niyi, good evening. Yetunde, Hamoile, good evening. Denise, good evening. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Evans McDonald, good evening. Nkiro Jimadu, good evening. Jay Koke, good evening. Anastasia McDonald, good evening. Ola Martin, good evening. Shinwe, good evening. Israel, welcome. Ola Laulu, welcome. Okay, let me show you the trailer that uh, Kate did yesterday. Let me see if it will work for you today. Okay, will you put it on, please? Uh, no, you need to make it, make it up and straight. Uh, I can't see the, it's supposed to have volume, isn't it? No, it was okay before. Well, that's that, the plague of silence. That's the topic, the plague of silence. So that is what we are going to be talking about this week, the plague of silence. Welcome everyone, once again. Nice to have you all back. Please, let's go and quickly share the link for today's message. Let's go share the link. Let's go share the link. The plague of silence. Plague of silence is what we are dealing with. And today I'm going to be talking precisely on the topic of the culture of silence equals the culture of evil. 
the culture of silence equals the culture of evil. Yesterday I spoke largely about how this culture of silence has brought a lot of devastation, a lot of evil, and a lot of damages to homes, families, and to the lives of women in particular. And uh, we had a lot of things that we spoke about, but, you know, the culture of silence is a, is a culture of evil. So today I'm going to continue uh, talking about the culture of silence equals the culture of evil. That means whenever people are silenced about evil that is happening, they are actually co collaborating with that evil and they are actually promoting that evil. So we are not supposed to be silenced about evil that is happening around us. We are supposed to learn to raise up our voices. Uh, the Bible is in the book of Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah chapter 62. In the book of Isaiah 62 verse 1. In the book of Isaiah 62 verse 1. The Bible tells us that for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. I really want to use this opportunity to commend some of the people who are not only uh, listening to me, but people who have started practicing this truth that we are talking about. Especially I want to commend uh, one of my very, very proud disciple that I'm very, very proud of. And this is a lady disciple. Can you believe it that a week doesn't pass by without me going to listen to this lady? I go to listen to her every week. And uh, because she is, in fact, when I listen to her, I feel I'm talking, I'm listening to myself. Uh, she is so, <laughs> in fact, I'm thinking, I don't know how she did it, but she is so much in sync with but Dr. Sunday Adelaide is almost like she is a female version of Dr. Sunday Adelaide. So, because I listen to her every week, so I this this week, day today, yesterday, or was it today? I decided to go listen to her, what she has to say. And I see that she's taking it to another level, especially supporting this message on not being silent. Uh, the lady I'm talking about is Ogenetega. Her name is Ogenetega Adobeji. Ogenetega. If you don't know her, if you don't know her uh, or her Facebook page, please go look for her. Ogenetega Adobeji. You, you, you just need to look for her. I don't know if she's on or not, but go anything, for anything you want to do. She has, I know it's very complex for somebody who is not from my area to be able to you know, it's not unless you see her, if she's, or oh, maybe somebody could write her name down. You know, the last one she just did, now that is strong. She was preaching on three kilometers church. I couldn't believe it. She just went for it. She, she's a revolutionary. That lady, she's going to leave a, a name in the annals of history. Believe me. You know, just try it. Try it. You know, just put a name in the, in the video section. And then write you know, Ogenetega videos, or that name will automatically come up. Ogenetega Adobeji videos. She has my photograph actually in a, as a page photograph. I, I mean, not my photograph, it's the Kingdom Driven Life, my book, because she had done a, uh, a series on that as well. So, so this lady is just a wow lady. She's just a wow, wow lady. I mean, you, in fact, I just beg you guys, go and be listening to her. She is something else. So I just want to commend someone like that and people, other people who have been supporting this message by, you know, raising their voices, by raising their voices and, uh, and um, you know, letting people know that 
uh, you know, all of us, we, the only way to eradicate evil from our world and society is to, is to raise our voice, is to actually talk. We need to talk. If we don't talk, nothing changes. Uh, we need to begin to talk. It is only when we talk that we are able, we are going to be able to change something in this world. Uh, so, okay, she's here. Uh, all right, she's here. Uh, Ogenitega Adobeji is here. Yeah, that's her name right there. You see the yellow photograph, picture there? That's her. Yeah, you remember that name. You know, you will thank me later. You will thank me later. <laughs> so, but the one, you know, she is, I mean, if we have, we just need a thousand people like her. If we have a thousand people like her who are going to be talking, who are going to be doing their own program and just exposing issues that are happening, raising issues and exposing issues, we are going to drive out all the deceptive pastors out of town. We are going to remove most of the deception from the church. Believe me, if we have as many people as Tega all over, everybody just talking about the topic that God put in their heart, about the topics that touch them. Don't just talk in your own kitchen. Don't just talk in your own house, in your parlor, with your husband, with your children. You know, you know, be bold in God. You know, rest in God. Hide yourself before behind Christ. Hide yourself in God and go by faith. Step out and begin to speak for him. And you will not believe what God will be doing through all of us put together. So this deception against, I mean, this movement against deception, if you have not yet registered, Go find the movement on Facebook and the group. Uh, it's called Movement Against Movements Against uh, uh, Deception in the Church. You go find it and go listen. Uh, let me go register because on on Saturday now we have decided that it is on Saturday we are going to hold our next meeting and we are going to invite both the ambassadors and the committee members. Last time we mainly invited the committee members, but. This time we are going to invite both the ambassadors and the committee members. So uh, if you don't register, though, we cannot invite you. So go register for that movement, for the movement against deception in the church. If you register and if, you know, I think they are going to pin the, the form here and you could follow the link in here in the comment section, section and uh, go, go and fill it out. And we are going to invite you. It's going to be 12 midday. 12, the mid, uh, 12, uh, 12 o'clock midday Saturday. So we are going to have a, it might not be on Facebook, we are going to have a conference room. So in the conference room, we are going to uh, have this meeting with all of us. So get ready, put your plans together uh, and make sure that you are able to make it. It's going to be a long meeting. It's going, at least it's going to be for two, I mean, three, four hours. So get ready for that meeting. It's going to be an organizational meeting. So anyway, the culture of silence is a culture of evil. Uh, Isaiah 62 verse 1, For Zion's sake, I would not hold my peace. For Zion's sake, God himself says, He is not a quiet God. So God himself does not support the culture of silence because God knows that the culture of silence is the culture of evil. So because God himself knows this truth, he would not be a partaker. He will not partake in the culture of silence. To silence and to sweep matters under the carpet, under the rug, and then keep quiet. So God himself you know, identifies himself. And since it's our God, we are made in his image. We are supposed to be like, just like him. And what God is saying that for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. I think we need to pin the, uh, yeah, the, the form there. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Even God himself said he will not hold his peace. God himself is saying that he will not rest. Why? Because of righteousness. Until righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamb that burns. Now, let's examine this scripture once again. God is speaking and he's saying he will not hold his peace. So if God is talking, what should you be doing? I mean, that is the, that is our God. I mean, he is the one who is, he is our maker. He is the one who made us. We belong to him. We, our life depends on him. So if he is talking, we cannot be silent. Anything, anything that you want to do really is what you see God doing. 
It is only what God is doing that you want to be doing. You don't want to do anything from just from your own, or you don't even want to, from your own initiative or by yourself. You don't just want to do things that other people are doing. If you really want to be on 100%, if you really want to be right, if you really want to be correct in any of your action, the best way to be correct, the best way to be on that 100% is by finding out what God does. You can never be wrong. In fact, if you could just get yourself to line up with God and to do exactly what God is doing, no force of evil, no force, no force of, oppos of opposition, no opposition force, no force of darkness can silence you, no force, no force of opposition, no force of an adv any adversary will be able to stand against you. That is the kind of time where the promises of God comes to pass. That greater is he that is in you than the he that is in the world. And that no evil shall be for you. It is when you are lined up with God. When you begin to follow God's full step. And when you are doing exactly what God wants you to do. And you are repeating. You are modeling God. The best way to live your life as a human being is to model God. If you could just find out what God's habit is about, if you could just find out what God would like to do, or what God himself aspires to do, or what God himself tells us about himself that he does in the Bible, like in this passage now, he tells us what is it, you want to know God's opinion about silence? You want to know, would, is it according to God's, would, because people go to church, right? And we see all kinds of atrocities going on in the church. We go to church, we see all kind of evil going on in the church. We go to church and we see all kind of negative things, all kind of things going on. And people will tell us that just be quiet, don't worry, you cannot say anything, just be quiet. You know, don't touch my anointed, don't touch my anointed, don't touch my anointed. But do you, you the, the only way for you to know what is correct is for you to find out what is God saying? What will God have done? And remember, the reason why God himself is going to talk and the reason why God cannot keep quiet is not just because God is temperamental. Some people say, oh, it's not my style. I'm not like that. It's not my temperament. I am, I'm the quiet type. I am, I'm the, you know, introvert. I'm not, it's not my type. It is not your type that determines what you do. The way we are supposed to live our life is to find out what is it that God does. It's not because it's my temperament. Ah, okay, ah, she's like that. Ah, ah, she's like that. She's just like that. She's just a nature. She just, ah, she will talk. She will never keep quiet. That is not enough there, a reason for us to talk or not to talk. Or oh, I will keep quiet. It's not my, it's not coming. It's not my style. I don't talk. You know, it's not my style. I just keep quiet. That is not an argument. The only single motivation, the only single explanation that should dictate your habit or your behavior or your action is only what would God have done in a similar situation. So you need to find out God's mind regarding what people are saying. So, or you see all kind of atrocities because the only way these atrocities about Titan offering has taken the center stage in Christianity that everybody now believes that the you know Titan offering only is belong to the church. It's because some somebody, it's not that some, nobody has seen it before Pastor Sunday. It's not that nobody has read the Bible and said that it's not for the church only. And it's not even to be brought to the church in the first place. It's to be used to, you know, first of all, it's to be used to take care of the people that God is talking about. I mean, and but other people have seen it, but they, they've kept quiet. In, because of the culture of silence in the church, so it has even gone to the extent now that anybody who begins to now question that question, tithe and offering is not supposed to be taken by the pastor or the church. And the, it's like you, yourself, you are the one in error. You know, it has, because it has, it's so entrenched now because of the culture of silence. Some people have been silent. And even apart from the Bible saying that, apart from reading in the Bible, even without reading it in the Bible, you want to tell me that there is no human being that I've seen that tithe and offering have been abused? You want to tell me that people have not seen that tithe and offering have been misused and mis been misappropriated? People know now. People know, but because of the culture of silence. So nobody is talking. Nobody is raising their voice. And that is why the culture of silence is a culture of evil. 
you are abating evil when you are silent about the things that you are supposed to speak about. So even if it is not your temperament to, to, to be loud or to be outspoken, but if God is speaking in a similar situation, if God himself is saying he's not holding back, so it doesn't matter what your temperature or what your temperament is again of. Because if God is speaking, you want to line up with him. You want to begin to speak as well. But if God is speaking and you are silent, you are in trouble. You are on your own. <laughs> if God is speaking and you are silent, you are on your own. If God is speaking and you are silent, you are on your own. But if God is silent and you are speaking, you are also on your own. But let's see what the Bible says about issues like this. The Bible tells us, God himself tells us. God himself is speaking. And hear what God is saying. He's saying, he said, for, Zion's, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. If anything, what is Zion? Zion, if the Bible tells us in Hebrews, that Zion, Hebrews chapter 12, that Zion, verse 22, Zion is the church. So anytime you read about Zion, it's referring to the church. So Zion, Mount Zion means the church. So now what God is saying here is that anything that pertains to the church, anything that will benefit the church, anything that will be a blessing, be a protection to the church, anything that will, you know, will benefit the church. The Bible says anything that concerns the church. God himself said for the church's sake or for Zion's sake, I will not be silent. I will not hold my peace. Not for my own self's sake. Not for the sake of my temperament. But for let's so what that's what is that what that is saying is that leave out temperament here. Leave out sentiment here. Leave out personal preferences here. Let's leave our personal preferences. Let's, if this is going to be good ultimately for the church, if this is beneficial to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know that's exactly what Jesus himself demonstrated. When Jesus came, he said, Ah, this in the temple, you have turned the house of my father into the den of robbers. He said, Again, for Zion's sake. For Zion's sake. It is not, he just said, Ah, you have turned the temple to the den of robbers so it is not for his own sake that he did it it's not for his own ministry's sake it's not for his own name's sake but for the sake of zion because he is in line with the father jesus is right in line with the father and what is what would father have done and these are the things that dictated jesus's reaction to situations and jesus's behavior the behavioral patterns and these are the same principles that should dictate our own behavioral patterns. What principle in particular? The principle is, what will God have done? You have to see God because the whole idea is that the Son cannot do anything but those things he sees the Father does. That the Son does. So the action of the Son is dictated by what the Father would have done in that situation. What the Father does. So because the Father had said in Isaiah 62, Verse 1 here, that I, for the sake of anything that pertains to the church, anything that pertains to Zion, I never will keep quiet. Jesus knows that word. That Father doesn't keep quiet if he's going to benefit the church. For, for the sake of the church, I must speak. So when it was now his time, when he was now here on the earth, he was modeling the Father. He was still faithful to that principle that the thing that informs his behavior and his actions are what God the Father would have done in that situation or what God does in that situation. So he has seen the Father respond and always reacted by talking out for the sake of Zion. So when it was now, when he now saw atrocities going on in the house of God, he behaved just like the Father would have behaved. He spoke out and he didn't just speak he acted and he went to the temple and chased out all the people who were defiling the, the temple and the church it is for the sake of zion so again isaiah 61 verse 2 i said sorry isaiah 62 verse 1 isaiah 62 verse 1 for zion's sake so 
that should be a marching order for all of us. The, 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 the principle is this. If this is good for the church, if this thing that is happening is damaging the reputation of the church, if this thing that is happening is bad for the church, if this thing that is happening is spoiling the name of my God, if it's not encouraging people to, you know, to be established in God, if it's not good for the name of God, if it's not good for the church, if, it's, if the church is being turned to something else, for Zion's sake, Isaiah 62, Isaiah 62 verse 1, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. So if you, therefore, see things that pertain to the church, see things that are not good for the church, and you are holding your peace, and you are silent about them, you are joining yourself into the camp of the enemy. Because the culture of silence is the culture of evil. You are putting yourself from the camp of the light. You are putting yourself from the camp of God into the camp of evil. You are actually, you yourself, you are aligning yourself with the author of evil himself. So that is what happens if you are not talking. That is just if you are not talking because that is what God expects from you. For you to speak about every evil that is detrimental to, this, to, to, for, for, to, to the cause of, of the church and to, for the, to the cause of Zion. So for Zion's sake, so you say, oh, but it's not good for me. It will, it's going to uh, deter my, no, no, be detrimental to my, to my reputation. Or they will chase me away. Or I will lose friends. Or uh, the people will not understand me. Or they will attack me. So, it, but it didn't say that for your own sake, he said. If it had been for your own sake, then everybody would be considering what is profitable for, for them and what is not profitable to them. But he, here, he's not saying for your own sake. Oh. So he's not telling you to consider what is beneficial to you. And make, so if it's not beneficial to you, you are, you are allowed not to do it. You do, this one, you don't have any option. This one, as long as it's not beneficial to the church of the Lamb, as long as it's not beneficial to the, to the Zion of God, as long as it is detrimental and it's not beneficial, you have to put your own reputation to the line. You have to risk anything that needs to be risked. Because, but you must be sure you are doing it for the sake. You shouldn't do it so that the thing will, you know, somebody's else church will scatter and you will take it up. It shouldn't be for your own sake. Your conscience must be right. Your conscience must be, you must be truthful to your conscience. That yes, I see that this thing is not good for God, it's not good for the church, it's not good for the name of God, it's not good for the and I'm seeing it. And I'm saying, you know, okay, me, I cannot talk all because people will criticize me. So you have exalted your own interest above God's interest. It means that you have exalted your own preferences above God's preference. It means that you have now said the Lord of your life is your own feeling. Oh, it's going to be bad for me. They are going to criticize me. They are going to attack me. So it means that your own feeling, what will happen to you, consequences of is now your Lord. So it is what on the basis of which for which on which you base your decision and judgment is now based not on what is right, not on what God would have done. So you are basing your judgment on your personal feeling, if it's going to be good for me. So you are the Lord of your life. Don't even bring God here then. God is not your Lord. God is not your master. You are the master of your own life. Your own life is all about you. What is good for me? What is beneficial for me? If it's about your benefit, if the basis upon which you are taking that decision is your own benefit, then you are on your own. You are all alone. Don't even mention God here. You are not a servant of God. You don't belong to him. You are not a son or his daughter, don't even try to identify with them. You are not even carrying his voice. You are not carrying his heart. You are not carrying his priority. His interest is not your interest. You don't want to please him. It means your life is not dedicated to pleasing him. Pleasing him is not your goal. It's not your priority. It's not your life. Your life is not about him, what he wants, what he desires. Whereas if you really are a Christian, if you are a really born again person, the your life is supposed to be all about one thing. That is will, not your will. That you are now living. What it means to be born again is that from the time you got born again, you overthrew your interest. You remove your own eye, the lordship of yourself upon your own life. You dethrone it. You remove your 
eye from the throne of your heart and you enthrone him his lordship and you now say from today on i submit my will to your will i submit my lordship to your lordship that means from today on the only interest that will supersede that will be preeminent in my life will be your interest i am only living by one dictation right now that your will i am only being guided by one instruction that your will that is in heaven be done here on earth that is what i dedicate my power to that's what i dedicate my energy to that's what i dedicate my time to that's what i dedicate my skills to that's what i dedicate my energy to if you are not living like that you don't you are just on your own you are not his own so if your life is all about pursuing his interest if your life is all about pleasing him if your life is all about doing what he wants if he is truly your lord if he is truly your master if you truly belong to him you will only be reasoning like this that i just want to please him it's all about pu pushing forward his interest pushing forward his will on the earth as it is left in fact my whole life is all about seeking for ways and methods to bring his will to pass on the earth as it is in heaven. That is what Christianity is supposed to be about in the first place. So that walk the way God, li God lives, for the sake God himself lived like that. So you don't want to divorce yourself from God. You don't want to divorce yourself from God's mindset and God's lifestyle. God's lifestyle is always about bringing the will of the Father to the earth as it, it, as it is in heaven. So our whole life is supposed to be thy will, not my will, but thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when I was talking about, you know, this hallelujah project that people talk about, hallelujah praise or whatever, hallelujah something challenge, and I tell people that I, it's a good stuff. If you, are, if you want to feel good, wow, the best project in the world. Go and feel good. But if you have graduated from just doing praise and worship to masturbate yourself, to stimulate yourself and make you feel good, okay, you have released. If you have gone beyond that form of Christianity and your own Christianity that is all connected to him, Thy will be done <laughs> on earth as it is in heaven. If it is all about, so you have to ask yourself the question: if What that program that I'm, that program that I'm going to, that church that I'm even going to on Sunday, that you no know, whatever, is it a, again egocentric Christianity so that I will get my miracle? It's all about me. So again, you are going to use God. You are committing another atrocity upon the one you have already committed. Most people go to church, they go to church to commit atrocity. What is the name of that atrocity? It is the Bible says, if you will, when you come to seek me, seek me for me, for who I am. Seek my face, not my hands. Seek me for who I am. Not for what to eat or what to drink or what to wear. Don't when you come to your to pray, to when you don't come to me with what to eat, what to drink, what to do. Come to me as if you are coming to your father. Relationship is what I need. I need you. Don't be using me as an ATM machine. Don't be coming to church to seek me just for me to be able to give you this and give you that and resolve that your problem and this your problem. Don't turn me to a pagan God because that's what they say. Because that is what the pagans do. That is what the pagans do. That is what the pagans do. That is what the pagans because they think that they will be hard for the multitude of their words. That's what the pagans do because they they think for that the more gyration they do, the more praise and worship, the more you know prayer, the more you know. Is, that is what my, it is all about. What they could get so that God will protect me, so that God will bless me, so that God will send me His miracle, so that God will send me the fruit of the womb, so that God. So it is you, you who is the idol. You are only using God to settle yourself. It is all about you. It is all about your will being done. It is not connected to his own will. It is using God to fulfill your own wish, your own will, your own desire, your own appetite, your own ego, your own lust. 
it is called idolatry. So that's why I say most people who go to church and those praise and worship programs and everything like that is all about idolatry again. It's all about using God to make me feel good. Ooh, ooh, I feel good. It is all about using God to get something again from me. What, what about finding out what he wants? What about finding out his heart crying? <laughs> what about finding out his own heartbeat? What about finding out the things that he wants to talk about and the things that he wants to scream about? <laughs> what about getting to hear from him? So that, but that, but that, the way that's the way you should be. That's why you should be praying. That's why you should be going to, 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 to his presence, to fellowship with him, so that you could hear from him. If you have not listened to my session, to my series on prayers, you will not understand this thing I'm talking about. Go and find my series on prayers. It's on YouTube. Series on prayer, prayer series. Go and listen to it. You will understand what I mean. What I mean, a lot of our religiosity, eh, what we people say we go to church to do, it is idolatry. Oh. It is what Jesus himself said. These are the acts, actions of the pagans. But you, you are supposed to look for me, to even come to me, to come to service for, just for the sake of finding me relationship with him but you don't need to go to church for that one you don't need to go anywhere it's in your heart it's near you it is is around you you are all around it's all around you is your presence you are in his presence so it's all about if seeking him you on one on one and when you find him finding out what is it you are saying lord what is your heart saying? What is your heart? Be? What do you want me to do? What do you normally do in similar situations? Then it will show you something like this. I will say, what I normally do is I never keep quiet. When it concerns the church, I don't keep quiet. You see, come and see. It's written in my Bible. Isaiah 62. One. You go and look at it. You will see that it says there, For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. So that now becomes a principle for you. That now should become a rule of how you behave yourself in life. So when people, other people will be saying, ah, keep quiet, don't wash the dirty linen of the church openly, ah, don't expose the church, don't, uh, you know, do something. You just say, you have already known, you have already found out, you already discovered how the father himself would have behaved. Now that you have found out how the father himself would have behaved, that you just line up with him. You just know exactly what to do and you will never be wrong. You can never get it wrong. If you first of all know how God the Father himself would have behaved and then you repeat, he goes before you, he backs you up with all his heavenly resources. It doesn't matter the co-host of hell that will be fighting you. It doesn't matter how many human beings will be against you. It doesn't matter how many people you, you, that one will, the, you, you will dislike or will dislike you or them, anybody you will anger. As long as you have already lined up the hand, that's what God would have done though, in my own situation. And he even says that that is what he does. For Zion's sake, he never keeps quiet. That is a principle right there. You got the principle. You line yourself after him to just say, okay, I know what to do. For Zion's sake, I don't keep quiet. Everyone's resources begin to back you up. So, and you know what? It doesn't really matter who doesn't back you up. It doesn't matter who doesn't support you. As long as heaven is supporting you, eh? Let all human beings, seven billion, all of them, let all of them be against you. Let all of them be fighting you, all present, all armies. It doesn't matter who is against you as long as he is for you. And when you are lining yourself up to do exactly the way you would have acted, to do exactly what you would have done, you know he is already for you automatically. So once he's on your side, doesn't matter who is against you. So who can be against us when God is for us? So now when you now go to places and they tell you, no, you cannot talk about this thing, don't talk about this, you know they are just being sentimental. You know it is a human attitude, it's a human reaction, but you have already found out God's reaction. So at the bottom line, in everything, in every area of life, even in family, even in church life, even in your business, everything you do must be emanating from what will God have done? What is God doing? What is God, what will God have done in this situation? And once you find that out and you align up with him, 
So that is how our whole life is supposed to be about. Our whole life is supposed to be about us finding out what God thinks, what God will have done, what will have been God's position, okay, and just repeating it. That's the secret of life. Once you do that, every other thing will start to work. So that's why we started this movement against uh, deception in the church. If you have not yet uh, joined, you see it is tagged here right now. It's pinned. It's the late last one there or the top one there on your screen in your comment section. You follow it at the end. Follow that uh, link or maybe even right now. And it's also on the page, the movement for movement against deception in the church. We have a page and a group. Go and fill the form, and then we will invite you for the meeting on Saturday. We have, we have decided to do the meeting 12 noon Nigerian time and UK time Saturday, which is 7 p.m. Eastern time in America. So we'll be that's when we'll do the meeting. So, but if you don't go to uh, fill it out, you will not be invited. Um, it's because it's going to be a closed meeting. And then if you have not yet also shared this message, please go ahead and share the message. Go ahead and share the message right now. Okay? Go share it publicly. Go share it with your friends. This could deliver some people. So what God is saying is this. Well, it's a matter of principle. So for, Zion, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. It's a principle. So if God is not holding his peace, you know what to do. God said, I will not hold my peace, which means... And you know where his image, all right? We are his own expression, we are his likeness. What does that mean? We see what he does, and as likeness, we repeat. We just do like him. That's how life is supposed to be meant to be lived. That is how life is meant to be lived. You find out what is his image, how does he look? Then you just line yourself and become his image and express him. That's how that is all secret to life. If you could live your life like that. You have discovered the secret behind life. So in this particular case, talk or not to talk. It is already clear. I already know what God thinks. I know what he would have done in my own place. I'm just doing the same thing. And what will he have done? For Zion's sake, find out. In whose interest is this? Will it be in the interest of God? In the interest of the church? Yes, it will be. Then I'm not holding my peace. I'm going on TV. I'm going on to, uh, Facebook. I'm going to start my own movement. I'm going to you know, start my Facebook live. I'm going to start my own Facebook page. If I cannot talk, I write. If I cannot write, I do something. I organize an NGO or something. You all of us, we have to think of what to do right now to begin to speak on behalf of the church and for, for, for Zion's sake, not to be quiet and not to hold our peace. So everyone, and I want to commend everybody that is already uh, doing something, one thing or the other. You know, I think it's not me that is commending you. I think everyone is telling you kudos to you. Uh, to every one of you that have started, you know, your own platform, that have started, you know, using one way or the other to, to spread out the wisdom of God, the, the lifestyle of God, the virtues of God, the, 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 the you know, so there are so many of you, there are about, over, about maybe 200 or 300 people who have, under the influence of DSA, started their own programs and their platform. Is that not beautiful? That's why, you know, kudos to all of you. And, you know, go ahead. And, you know, if you have not started your own, if you don't know what to do yet, go ahead and begin to do something. Go ahead and think about it. You know, you already know that you need to expose every atrocity that has been done against the, the church of God and in the name of God, every deception that is holding the people of God into captivity. For Zion's sake, God does not hold his peace. And he said, and for Jerusalem's sake, that Jerusalem is like the, the kingdom of God. For the sake of the kingdom, for the two sake, for the, there are two things that you will never be silent about th that will benefit the church and that will benefit the kingdom of God. Two things. If the thing will benefit the church of God, if the thing will benefit the kingdom of God, not benefit from the side of human though. Like for example, uh, we were having a program just one hour or two hours ago, right? And somebody uh, told me, uh, the boys, you know, uh, Victor and uh, Arno, they told me what some pastors in Ukraine here, African pastors, are saying. And what they are saying is that Pastor Sunday is more dangerous than all the demons in Ukraine put together. Pastor Sunday is more dangerous uh, to, to the church. 
and that but so let's find out if i'm dangerous to the church because i said don't take your tithe and offering to any church where you are not sure what the pastor will use the tithe and offering for if you are sure if you are certain that your tithe and offering will be used in that church to promote the kingdom to do the work to do what jesus said i was hungry and they fed me i was naked and i was clothed i was in prison i was in hospital if you with your tithe and offering is doing that and you can trace it you know uh, of course you should take your tithe and offering there if you know that your tithe and offering is being used for what jesus said that 90 percent of tithe and offering must be used for the orphans for the uh, widows for the fatherless for the uh, strangers for the destitute and the disadvantaged if you are sure that your church is doing like that eh, then you can go ahead and take your tithe but if you are not sure you use your own tithe and offering and do the way jesus said to do use it to feed him and it's not the people who are hungry or him it's him use it to clothe him use it to take care of him in prison in 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 hospital use it for jesus direct why should you use it to give it to the church when you can give it to jesus direct and he said it is me you do it all. so do it to him direct do your title because your title and offering belong to him anyway so so that's the idea but because i said that these people now said pastor sunday is more dangerous because the, most of them 90 98 percent of them or 99 percent of them don't work they only live off the tithe and offering that students are paying from their school fees people will parents will give students money to pay for their school fees and they, they, these pastors who the people are so wicked they, they will be asking people to pay tight an offering or commitment or partner something from their school fees so and since they don't work that is the only thing they do so now that i'm saying don't take it to pastor if pastor is not using it for the right something now they now say i am more dangerous than all the demons in this country i am the one that is more dangerous than all the world but so but we hear what god is saying for whose sake if this thing i have said my own i've passed the exam in my own heart if this thing i have said is good for the church of the lord jesus christ why is it good for church? Because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ must do what Jesus Christ wants. And, you know, since the thing I'm doing is to return the church to the Lord Jesus Christ, I know um, I passed the test. And then if the thing also is good for Jerusalem, say for the case of the kingdom, what I've said, people should not take money and tithe to the church. If they are not sure of that church, they should rather take to go and meet all the needies and the destitute around them. And that is what was done in the, in the Acts of the Apostles when they brought all the offerings and the tithe and offerings in the book of Acts of the Apostles, they were not given to the pastors. Uh, they were not used to pay rent. Or they were used to take care of the needs of the less privileged people in the church. So, so I know that, I, you, know, you know, God is excited. I know everyone is rejoicing because of what I'm doing. So even if they say I am the uh, I'm more dangerous than all the demons and all the demons. I know they, they, um, they put me in a good company because that's what they said about my Lord and Savior. If they now have, have grown to, to reach a stage that thank God I, <laughs> you are complimenting me rather, you are complimenting me because you know it's the same thing what they said about Jesus. So let's go ahead and share the link to this message. The Bible says for Zion's sake. So if it is for Zion's sake, for the church's sake, you must you must not be quiet if you are quiet you are walking against the kingdom you are walking against the father because the father himself is not quiet then for jerusalem's sake for the if the thing is good for the kingdom of god you cannot keep quiet because even the father himself even jesus himself is not keeping quiet because of the sake for the sake of the kingdom of god if the thing is good for the kingdom of god if it's going to advance the kingdom of god if you're going to advance the cause of the church you should never keep quiet too. If God is not keeping quiet, who are you to keep quiet? You have to raise your voice until her righteousness. She say, all of us have to talk and keep on talking. Until when? When should we stop? Until the righteousness of the church. Until the purity of the church. Until, until the brightness of the church. Until the, the glory of the church shines forth out of the church. Oh. You see, until our righteousness goes forth. You see, the righteousness of the church must not be maintained and in the four walls of the church. The righteousness of the church is it becomes counterproductive when it's just kept within the church. The righteousness of the church is like the light that is put in the in a place. Too many projectors of light 
and everybody is just shining their light in a very you know, limited amount of space in the four walls of the church. Nobody will see anything again. You will be blurred. So the righteousness of God is not meant for the church. The righteousness of God is not meant for the four walls of the church. That's why you shouldn't be bragging yourself that I go to church. I don't miss church. That is not where the righteousness of God is meant for. You shouldn't be bragging yourself that I go to church two times a week. That is not where the righteousness of God is meant for. The righteousness of God is meant for the outside of the four walls of the church. The righteousness of God is meant for the sphere of, of life, every area of life. That's why it says you should not keep quiet. What is the purpose of your talking for? Is that the righteousness of God that Christ gave to us will not just be maintained in the church, but it will go from the church, from the four walls of the church, it will go forth as brightness into the dark. And where is brightness needed? Where is light needed? Light is always always needed only where there is darkness now. Light is needed for that for illumination. Light is light is needed only where darkness was. Is for so the righteousness of God is supposed to be the light for the darkness of the world. It's not for the light for the church that is already full of too much light. So it is saying with the reason why we speak. Some people are telling me, oh, but why should you speak on Facebook? Why should you, you know, go and put, gather pastors now in some building, you know, go just do a meeting for pastors only so that we will wash our own linen in this secret. But God doesn't want that righteousness that we want to do to remain in the church just for the church's sake. No, he wants the righteousness to go from even the church self. So this righteousness that go from the church and spread to the world. It is only that, 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 that the word of Jesus will come to pass. That let your light so shine. And he didn't say it should shine in the church. Oh. He said let your light so shine in the world. That the people of the world will see. That people will see your light. And then they will respond. How will they respond? They will give glory to your father who is in heaven. You see they will give glory to your father who is in heaven. When your light is not shining in the church. Oh. When your light is shining outside of the church. So you say, that's why we are doing what we are doing. That's why we are starting all this. He said, let your good works. He said, let your good works be seen by the people in the world. It's not just for, from the four walls of the church. No, our good works are meant for the people so that they will see our light. They will see our righteousness. He said, that when your light shines, they will see your good works. They will see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So our righteousness is not meant for ourselves so that we are shining each, on each other's face and we are brightening and blurring each other. So, no, no, it's supposed to be for the world. So we are speaking for the world to, to, to be enlightened. We are speaking for righteousness of God to shine forth to the world. That is our goal. And then, and her salvation as a lamb, that uh, salvation then will come as a lamb to those who are in darkness and they will experience God's salvation God's redemption, and they will come and taste the salvation of the Lord. You see, so that is what they're saying. You know that if, that's why we should never keep quiet. That's why if God is not keeping quiet, we are not keeping quiet. Let's see. You know, the other time I told you about the quotation that was uh, the statement that was made by Edmund Burke, and Edmund Burke says the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. The only thing that is necessary. For the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. The only thing that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. But that is Edmund Burke who said that. Now, let me give you another quotation today, which was rendered by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson said something similar, very similar to that. And what he said is, all tyranny needs to gain a foothold is for people of good conscience to remain silent. Silent. All, all that tyranny needs to establish himself and gain a foothold is for people of good conscience to remain silent. So that is, you know, Satan and tyranny is waiting. Satan himself. That's why I said that the culture of silence equals the culture of evil because evil itself is praying that you will be quiet and the reason evil is praying that you will be quiet is because everything that evil needs or we could even say this paraphrase it and say all that satan needs to get a foothold is for people of good conscience to remain silent all that satan needs 
to gain a foothold is for people of good conscience to remain silent. So anytime that they are telling you and they are putting you under pressure to remain silent about righteousness that could benefit the people of God, about the righteousness that could benefit the church of God, about the righteousness that could benefit the kingdom of God, and they are saying and convincing you to keep quiet. And they are making you to be a collaborator with evil. They are making you to be a, a, a collaborator with Satan. They are making you to be a partner with evil. Because all that evil needs, all that Satan needs, all that tyranny needs to get a foothold for unrighteousness, all the unrighteousness that we are talking about in the church, that, you know, all this is happening, all that is happening. You know why it is getting, it is, it has gained the foothold? In fact, all the compromise that we have talked about, all the darkness that we say is happening in Nigeria and African church, Pentecostal church, all this money, the corruption and everything. The reason why they have come there to stay, the reason why they are gaining and they have gained the stronghold that they have right now in the mind of the people is because of silence. It's because people who knew better, people who were, who were supposed to have been speaking a long time ago, did not keep quiet because we have now celebrated silence as a virtue instead of saying it as a vice. We have now, you know, you know, Satan is so subtle. Satan is right there in the church, enthroned himself. Satan has enthroned himself as the God, as the tyranny. And the tyranny is the tyranny of silence. It's the only thing, it doesn't need you to do, some people will say, but I'm not doing the thing now, I'm not doing the thing. Only I cannot speak, I, I will not speak. Hey, okay, that's exactly what Satan needs. You say that we're just going to celebrate. He's just dancing and he just hey, bang, bang, go. He doesn't need you to do the thing, no. He doesn't need you to do the evil. He doesn't need you to do anything bad. The ones that will do the thing, they are there. But the thing that he needs from you is that you that knows better, you that has conscience, you that is a child of God, that you will keep quiet. As long as you keep quiet like this, he is doing his job and he's taking a stronghold. I mean, a, a, a stronghold is 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 uh is a foothold, sorry, is taking a food foothold, is establishing his influence because people of good conscience like yourself, you have decided to become his collaborator by keeping quiet. And that's why God knows this, and God said, No, he doesn't behave like that. That's not his nature. His nature is the opposite. God said, For Zion, for Zion's sake, I will not keep quiet. Because God knows that to keep quiet is to give evil and Satan a you know to, you know a, an opportunity to gain a foothold and establish themselves and you know they do their evil work because God is quiet or because people of God are silent because God knows better that if anybody that knows better if people of good conscience like God like Jesus will keep quiet it is that quietness that make them to be collaborators with evil. So all that tyranny needs, all that Satan needs, all that evil needs to gain a foothold is for people of good conscience to remain silent. So if you are remaining silent for something that would have been otherwise good for the sake of God, for the kingdom of God, otherwise good for the church and for the sake of the people of God, and you are keeping quiet or for ordinary for even people, ordinary people everywhere, you have become a collaborator with evil. You have become a collaborator with evil. Let me tell you, let me show you another. That was uh, Thomas Edison who said that. Let me now show you another scripture, another pass, another quotation that makes all these people. You see, Thomas Edison, they know the they know the Bible, they know this is God's attitude. God's attitude is that for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. So, the, I will not rest means I will walk. I will not hold my peace that I will talk, but I will not just talk. I will not rest as well. So, talk is one, but I will also act. And that's why, like I said again, we started this, our movement against deception in the church. That we are not just talking, I'm not just preaching, but we are also acting. We will not rest. So if you are really for God and you want to act like God, you will both talk and act. You will both talk and act. You will both talk and act. Not acting like doing evil like other evil people themselves or not going to kill people and things like that. No. But acting in the positive. Acting by eradicating evil 
and bringing the truth of the kingdom of God, you know, to 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 to, 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 to bear it. Let's see what uh, Martin Luther King said, Black Luther King Jr. of uh, the United States of America, the civil rights uh, movement leader. He said, the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people. That is not the ultimate tragedy. Yeah, it's bad that there is cruelty. It's bad that there is oppression. But that is not the ultimate tragedy. So what could be bad than that? What could be worse than the cruelty of the bad people? What could be worse than the oppression of the evil people? The only thing that could be worse that every evil that you know in this world, there is one thing that would be worse than it. So what is it? How did Martin Luther King acknowledge or recognize the thing? He said the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence. The silence by the good people over the oppression that's going on and the cruelty. The silence of the good people is actually worse than the oppression itself. The silence of the good people is actually worse than the cruelty. So the silence of the good people is worse than rape. Because if you know about rape and you just say, ah, no problem, it didn't concern me. You have to commit the same rape through your consent. The silence of the good people is better than racism. I mean, it's worse than racism and lynching and killing. It's worse than murder. Because you know about that murder. It's because of your silence that murder. If not for your silence, murder, that murder would not take place. If not for your silence, that cruelty would not take place. If not for your silence, that wickedness would not take place. If not for your silence, that oppression would not take place. It is thanks to the silence of the tyrant. It is thanks to the silence of the upright, of the righteous, of the good people, that evil is having a heyday. So that the fact that we have to start this movement against deception in the church is a must. And on Saturday, we are going to talk more about that. 12 noon UK time, but it's not going to be live. It's, going to be, uh, it's not going to be on open Facebook live. It's going to be an oil close meeting we are going to do strategy meeting for anybody who has registered. So if you have not yet registered, go and join the movement against deception in the church Facebook page and group and fill the form. The form is right here. You can, you know, go and download the form, fill it, send it in so that we'll send, we'll send you the invitation so that you can join us on time. And if you have not yet shared this uh, link, go ahead and share the link. Go ahead and share this video and set people free. So can you see how powerful this word is? The ultimate tragedy, the greater tragedy, is not the oppression of the oppressor, is, is not of the oppressor, and it's not the cruelty of the bad people. The ultimate tragedy, the ultimate tragedy, the ultimate evil, is the silence of the good. That's the ultimate evil. I hope you have had God today. And it doesn't matter where the evil is taking place, either in the church or at home or in the society. If you know about it and you are silent, you are a culprit. And God is going to hold you accountable. Like yesterday, I took a poll to ask people to ask people to tell me when do they would they prefer for us to have the meeting is it saturday or friday so most people say saturday most people say saturday so that's why we are doing it for saturday 12 noon so who is ready who is the first one to talk i have my young disciples here so i want them to compliment or to add to this uh, message because they're all all of them have their own revelation they have their own idea i cannot monopolize the truth i can also have the only one who understands or who knows the truth i'm learning from them also so victor you are the first one that is presido they call it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you so much for the privilege. Uh, it's good to see you guys again this evening. We're still on the topic, uh, the, I will paraphrase the danger, the plague, the, the, plague, the, plague of the disease of silence. And uh, many, of, many of us are not uh, silent in terms of not talking. Uh, we are silent in terms of not talking about the right things. Disease, for me, I have come to understand it, not necessarily as a problem that is organic. And even when it is functional, it is not necessarily that it is not functioning well. Disease could mean not functioning in the right place. So anything that functions without ease is diseased. So this plague could also be that we do not talk where the talk is needed. I know so many of us and this is the substratum for backbiting and talking behind people's back. That we are so much, we are, we are very opinionated uh, where the issue is not present. But where the main issue is meant to be addressed, we shy away. Probably for the fear of being labeled or for the fear of losing a precious connection or for the fear of being ostracized from settings. I mean, from, from uh, probably are things you gain from uh, the person who, or the, I mean, who is uh, responsible for the things against which uh, you ought to speak. Then again, the question would be, do you really have a good self-concept? Because if you do, you would understand that your opinion is needed in the right place and that there's no other right place than the place where that event, that situation, that uh, circumstance is uh, ongoing. So we cannot afford to keep talking where things won't change. <laughs> A lot of us are very good at arguing in our Homes in there, yeah, we, we, we argue with our friends, but we will never look for the next place where they are about to make views that affect your country, that affect your local government, that affect your, your state to talk. A lot of us know how to talk about people, but never talk on issues. And when issues are happening, it is not really talking about the person that matters, but talking and engaging on the issues. So if you are talking about a person when you should be engaging issues, you are probably silent while you are yet talking. That was why Jesus did not spend so much time. I didn't, I, he wasn't talking about the devil. He was addressing the issues. That is why the scripture says, for this reason, the Son of Man was made manifest. That he may destroy the works of the devil. So he was addressing issues, not talking about who is, I mean, responsible for the issues. Maybe I'll give you a quick uh, expo before Pastor comes another time to give you the full download. To this afternoon, we're meant to talk about the three sons of Adam. So I hope Pastor permits me to do that. <laughs> Let me quickly do that before it comes back. <laughs> the three sons of Adam. Do you remember them? The three sons. The first was who? Cain. Then you have who? Abel. And you have who? Seth. Pastor said Cain was the problem. Abel was the victim, but Seth was the solution. So, a lot of us are living in the reality of Cain by being a problem, by not speaking, by being silent. 
And a lot of us are also very silent by living in the reality of Abel by being a victim. How many of us will dare to be the set that speaks our solution? How many of us will speak not for the sake of talking? Pastor is not saying talk. Pastor is saying speak. Speak, not talk. Talking is the, the sheep. Is, yeah, everybody talks. I mean, even when it's anybody can talk. I remember when we were in uh, first year, first year of medicine. Uh, was that first year or second year? Then we had uh, a friend in our, our, our group mate, and the teacher after the class gave you know marks, and uh, the teacher gave her three out of five. And she was like, but ma, I spoke. I talked to the and teacher says, not about opening your other cavity. <laughs> five, five, to get five is not just about opening your other cavity. You have to say something that actually makes sense. So to say, yeah, to say something that makes sense means you have to understand the issues and speak to address them. Don't say, and, and this is where a lot of us have problems. We never understand the issues. We do not study the issues. We do not try to, to find out what is wrong to understand how can we solve it and begin to speak out solutions. So, you know, the whole world is full of people talking about what the problem is. We understand the problem. We talk about it every now and then. But the people who make impact, the people who make change, are the people who prefer solutions. So speak today with an intent of being a solution provider, of being a set. Thank you. God bless you. Okay. We have uh, another disciple here who is going to bring enlightenment. Uh, thank you so much, Victor. Thank you, sir. Yeah, hello, everyone. It's nice to be here again. This is Anu Joe. And, uh, well, this is an enlightening series. Uh, on the plague of silence uh, one thing I want to really talk about this evening is one mountain that has uh, hindered a lot of us from actually voicing out and speaking and that mountain is many of us claim to be born again many of us claim to have given our lives to Jesus but uh, listening to Dr. Sunday and getting full understanding of what it means to be born again. Uh, maybe many of us will have to be born again again. <laughs> because uh, the whole idea of, of um, being born again, of surrendering your life to Jesus um, and making him the Lord of your life. You know, it's very easy for us to just confess Jesus as the Lord. But to move from just confessing him as Lord and making that confession to become our reality is a different ball game entirely. And while I was listening to what Dr. Sunday was saying today, and he was communicating the reason why many of us actually, uh, why we are not speaking out is because we are still the lords of our lives. Yeah. And being the lords of our lives, we, we are so conscious about what, what is going to happen to us, the consequence of speaking out. How would I be perceived? What would be the opinion of the public? What will happen to me? If I say this, would I be, uh, would I be uh, spoken badly about? What would people say about me? And Unknowingly, what we are really saying is, and all of these thought processes are actually communicating how really unsaved we are, although we are going to church, although we are claiming to be believers, although we are claiming Jesus to be the Lord of our lives, but really we are the Lord of our lives. And I'm, just, I'm not just saying this to you out there, I'm saying this to myself. You know, he said something today that really uh, broke down a lot of uh, what, a lot of barriers because there are many things that we do that we have excuses like 
this is who I am. I'm, I'm not the kind of, that, that this is my temperament. This is, I'm not, I'm not the um, expressive, explosive, um, extroverted kind of person. And that, we use that as an alibi. We're like, no, okay, so this is me. Uh, this other person is more expressive. He can talk better. He, 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 won't, he won't want to keep quiet. He's going to talk. But then... Getting the understanding that it's really not about empower, about my temperament. And the scripture that Dr. Sunday used today, he said, for Zion's sake. So, about getting myself out, it is not because, it is not about how I will feel. It is not about what will happen to me after I get to speak. But it is about if this is for the kingdom. If my speaking would cause the will of God to come on earth as it is in heaven, then I dare not keep quiet. If my keeping quiet will hinder the expansion of God's kingdom, if my keeping quiet would not make God's kingdom to come on earth, if my keeping quiet will hinder the execution of God's will on earth, earth as it is in heaven then what that means to me is that i've not made god the lord of my life yeah. what that means to me is that i am still my savior i'm jesus is not my savior he's not my lord but when i get away from the throne of my life when i take i me myself out of that throne and I dethrone myself. I dethrone my feelings. I dethrone what I think about it. And I make Jesus the Lord. When it comes to take that seat as the Lord of my life, then it's not really about what I want to do. I begin to talk like Jesus when he starts saying that my meat is to do the will of the Father. That's fine. What satisfies me because... We all understand the idea of meat. We all love meat, although we have some vegetarians that don't, do, that don't like meat. But the whole idea of the meat is what will, bring, what will bring satisfaction to me? What would what would what I actually desire is that not my will, but God's will. And that exactly is the proof that I am genuinely saved. So the question we should be asking ourselves this evening is actually, am I genuinely saved? Did I just get a fire, a fire license or a fire, um, what's the word again? A fire insurance. Because many, many of us, we just, we, just, we just went to get a fire insurance and we just want to escape um, hell and just want to just run into Jesus and we really haven't accepted him. Because until this is actually addressed, until we, we stop being the Lord of our lives, and I say this, until we stop being the Lord of our lives, we will continually be silent. I tell you, no matter the amount of messages you listen to in this series, if you are still the Lord of your life, you will not, you will not talk. <laughs> if you are still the Lord, you will not talk because you will still have, you will have valid to you, you have valid alibis as to why, why should I talk? But when God is the Lord of it, when you've lost every iota of yourself, when you're not just thinking about what I will get, what will happen to me, but when I'm thinking about what his will is, we see the decadence in the church. And when I'm thinking about what if that pastor of that church would see me as I'm antagonizing him. But when what we think about, when all that is in our mind, all that we born for, all that we are passionate about is, am I here to fulfill the will of the Father? And is my speaking out, is my coming out to address issues, actually bringing the will of God the Father to materialization here on earth? Well, if that is what it will do, I don't mind how many how many enemies I will get. I don't know. I don't mind how many stones would come 
you see, the truth about it is that they, they, they tried to stone Jesus many times. <laughs> I, read, I read a part of the scripture where as they, they were about to, to, to stone Jesus, he just looked for a, a way to run away. He escaped. So there might be many times we might have to escape because we are saying the truth. But, but the, the truth is we must actually be like Jesus. And that is one thing I've learned from Dr. Sunday, to be like Jesus. We must imitate him. We had a discussion yesterday, and, and he said something that, just listening to it on, on the peripheral, on the superficial note, you think, oh, what is this man saying? He said, he said, he doesn't see himself as a preacher. You know, he's not a preacher. Neither does he see himself as a teacher. No. Because what preachers do is that they come to just share the message. That's all. <laughs> they come to proclaim. I proclaim to you. Or explain. Or explain. That's all. That's all they do. Preachers, teachers, teachers explain. They break things down. They, they create a wonderful picture in your mind. You can see. Well, I just graduated from medical school. And I had a lot of teachers that taught me how smoking is a risk factor to several diseases they teach me they explain to me the pathophysiology they explain to me the mechanism of how all the cancerogens and everything that is in is in the cigarettes can actually lead to cancer they teach but what they teach they've not embodied that is why when they are done teaching me they are doctors they teach us after they are done teaching about how smoking is a risk factor to several cancers you see them by the corridor or outside the hospital, they are smoking. <laughs> <laughs> they are smoking right there. But, but excuse me, he just taught us, he just explained to us the mechanism of how cigarettes would lead to cancer. And yeah, they teach. They teach. The same thing in the, with the, in the body of Christ. We have a lot of teachers. We have a lot of preachers. But how many people, and, and then Dr. Sunday said that he doesn't just want to be a teacher or a preacher, but he wants to, he wants to reveal God. He doesn't want to just talk about God and share wonderful pictures about God, who God is to people. Oh, God is amazing. God is this. God is that. He doesn't just want to just talk about God. What he wants to do is, if you want to see God, just like what Jesus Christ said. He said, whosoever have seen me, I've seen the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. But that is also my desire. That is also what I want. That whosoever sees me will see the Father. And what does this mean? If the Father would not keep quiet, if Jesus would not keep quiet, I rest my case. In keeping quiet anymore. <laughs> Hello, everyone on the platform. This is Ivy Peter. Doctor, I really want to appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, doctor, you don't know what you have done. You have given a lot of people life. This on this uh, on this series. Permit me to quote the, the quotation of uh, Martin Luther King. He says that our lives begin to end the day. We become silent about the things that matter to us. Let me quote it again. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent to the things that matters to us. So what that means, if we are not speaking, speaking about oppression, about tyranny, we are not living. So for the fact that this message has come, so he has given birth to a lot of people who have become alive again and again. Some of the issue that 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 people fear to speak up is the fear of life. They, will, they don't want to lose their life. Please, can somebody do me a favor and pin 
and pin this scripture for me mark chapter 8 verse 30 35 mark 8 35 the bible says that he that loveth his life shall lose it and he that is ready to lose his life will save it that is the principle in the kingdom of god for when you love your life you will lose it if you don't want to speak up you will lose your life but if you are ready to sacrifice your life on the altar of doing the will of god you will save your life i want you not to keep quiet never again don't keep quiet on the afflictions of the poor don't keep quiet on the tinery never you keep quiet again on the things that you see that are wrong in our society in the churches in africa in ukraine anywhere you are watching from never keep silence let your voice be heard let's let, let your voice be heard in writing let let your voice be heard in live broadcast let your voice be heard let your voice be heard God created you for your voice to be heard. God created you so that he can speak through you. Let your voice be heard. As you are listening to me now, let your voice be heard. Let your voice be heard to defend the poor. Let your voice be heard. Let our voice be heard. Let us not be quiet. This is my humble submission to every one of us. Thank you, everyone. Doctor, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, anybody wants to speak? Who is the next person I want to share? Okay. Okay. Good day, everyone. Good to see you all on the platform. This is Lola Sharonke. And uh, this topic absolutely is important to us as the body of Christ because we have been given so much and we have access to the greatest wisdom, the greatest knowledge that we can use to speak up. And I know that some of the, um, maybe, you know, uh, anxiety about speaking up is that just like uh, um, I did, spoke about, losing you know you're thinking about losing your life and all the rest of it well i can tell you that um and, and and also you may be thinking about your personality you may say oh i'm i'm a quiet person you know somebody who is loud and and all of that they're the ones that can speak up and, and speak out and people will hear their voices actually no it doesn't have to be that way I would say from when I think of the experiences that I've had about speaking up and it really has had an impact. When I tell my stories about what I do, I mean, I was telling Babush yesterday about, you know, different wisdoms and things that the Lord has used me in my quiet uh, appearance to do and nobody would know <laughs> that I was even involved in it at all. And it's not like I'm hiding, but um. In some situations, when you're speaking up, there's certain things I want to talk about. When you're speaking up about something, uh, you want something to be brought to light, you want justice on a situation. There are some situations that you really have to think through. Yes, you will speak up. But supposing you speak up on an issue of a, a battered wife. Let's say you know um, a battered wife, you know her situation. You've seen her injured and all the rest of it. And you are now telling her that, you know what, uh, I think you, you, you need to leave your husband. I, I think you, you need to uh, get away from this situation. And she has kids and all this kind of thing. You're giving her all these wonderful ideas about, you know, how she just needs to get herself out of the environment and this and that. What I've learned over the years is this. Think through, yes. You're going to speak out. You're going to give her advice. But what after you give her the advice, what are you going to provide for her? Are you going to provide your home? Are you going to stick your neck out for her? 
to be ready for her husband come banging down your door saying bring my wife back to me i mean what provision what is the house of refuge for people or for issues that you're going to be speaking out about you must always think deep and be strategizing that i am going to speak out but after i do what is my action to help in this situation and i believe that's what uh the movement that we have going on now uh the movement of um deception um against deception in the church that is what it's all about what is about is that it's not just one voice now speaking out some of us that appear quiet some of us that appear loud we're all joining together and what i'm believing that is going to happen in this movement is that we are actually going to identify what are the deceptions going on in the church we'll be able to call them by name because if we can't call them by name then we do have no idea what we're talking about we have to be able to know them by name and we have to have practical strategies for places of rescue what i mean is that after we have spoken we must think about what the next step and the next step and the next step is and i'll give you an example when i was in maryland i was fortunate to meet uh, a friend that knew four people they were police officers and uh, they had their professional job as a police officer but they also had their ministry which actually linked to our church so i was able to go with them i, I wanted to be involved in this ministry but little did i know of what i was going to learn in this ministry and their ministry was the ministry to prostitutes in washington dc high class prostitutes that of course they knew because they were police so they knew all these prostitutes and so what they did for their ministry when I was joining them was that we would go out. They've already trained us how to go out, how to, how to talk to them. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that's going on because there's a set of police watching the pimps. It, there's a whole lot of things that goes on. But I just want to talk about the, the part that we play. So we go out and we, 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 we start questioning, you know, the ones that allow us to. You know this kind of lifestyle how did it happen what happened to you we meet their needs we bring blankets food all kinds of things we bring with us to give to them while we're trying to have the discussion now if any one of them accepted that they wanted to remove themselves from that environment for that day so this is what i learned if that prostitute said yes they wanted to leave that environment number one they were protected because there are other cops looking out for the pimps. Those are their owners. So we can safely get those prostitutes. But I noticed that after speaking to them and they accept, they, they, they had another process where we now took them to a safe home. They, they knew who owned these safe homes. So they had safe homes available already. So it wasn't like you went to go talk to the prostitutes and then it was like, okay, so now that she has said she, she wants to change her life, well, what do we do now? No. Everything is thought through carefully. So now this prostitute had a safe place to go. From the safe place, after staying there, sort of, some of them are on drugs and all these kind of things. After dealing with those situations, if they still committed to, to continue with the process. The next process was that the church, they now went to the church. There's a special program in the church now that we involve them in. There's transportation from the safe home to the church. At the church now, they begin to teach them by a few other people who have lived that kind of lifestyle. They are now uh, taught and coached and encouraged and shown the scriptures and allowing them to know that they're accepted and give them the story about how Jesus sees them and so on and so forth. So that was another process from, from there. And if they still committed to wanting to change and they stayed a little longer, before you knew it, they were trained now to be uh, coaches for other other people that prostitutes that came in like them so what I'm trying to say that it speak up yes but also ask yourself and think to and say okay now that I've spoken what do I have to offer you know you may say oh don't abort your your child it's not good you're not supposed to kill a human being and this and that. okay great now that you've spoken up for that person what's left what do you have to offer them so what I'm saying is that let us be, and I believe that in our movement, that's 
part of the things that we're going to talk about. Let's have places of refuge, uh, refuge, uh, refuge for people. Let's have solutions for people. Okay, you want to come out of the church and you want your mind renewed. Let, let's have things like, okay, since you want your mind renewed, you need to start reading these kind of materials. Uh, books that Pastor Sunday uh, uh, wrote, teachings that he taught. These are processes of changing the mind. So we must be assisting people, not just speaking up, but we must make them know that we speak up and we have what you need. We know we know what you need after you, you, you we've spoken up for you. We know the next steps. We know what to do. So I'm just saying that as Christians, let us know that it's a full process. It's not just speaking up. It's not just taking action. But also you've got to have a place for all these things that we're going to be speaking of. We're going to have a process. We're going to have a place for people to come in, grow, be delivered, and be able to walk uh, 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 confidently as one, you know, that has been spoken up for. So that's what I just wanted to share. Thank you. Okay. Well, 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 that's what we've got today. The, to, uh, the culture of silence is the culture of evil. And, uh, you know, please go ahead and fill the form. Uh, the link there, the, 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 is paid, the form is pinned out there. Movement Against Deception. We are not just going to talk, we are going to act as well. And if you cannot act alone, it's good. Let's act together. Join the movement. Join the movement against deception in the church. Go fill the form. Then we'll invite you for the inaugural meeting, the organizational meeting that we're going to have on Saturday, 12 noon UK time and 12 noon Nigerian time. And um, yeah, so let the revolution begin. Let's begin to spread the righteousness of God uh, by speaking out and by acting to spread the truth of the kingdom of God and not to collide with evil any longer. And um, thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Shoronke and every other person who has spoken. And uh, if you have not yet shared this link, please go ahead and sh uh, press the link, go and press the link, and uh, uh, go and press the share button. And don't look for the share button, let's press the share button and share the message. And if you have not been listening to Ogene Tega, uh, you know, we had her name out. She has some teachings there that are just terrific. You know, go, go look for her name. Ogene, Ogene Tega is her name. She is good. She just, she just fabulous. You know, you, everybody needs to listen to her. Okay. So thank you. I'll be back tomorrow, two times. I come on two times a day, 5 p.m. UK time every day, and Nigerian time, 5 p.m. And 12 noon, no, no, that's 5 p.m. Yeah, that will be 12 noon UK, uh, that is 12 noon uh, American time, and uh, uh, that's Eastern time in America. And uh, 7 p.m., that's the second time I come on UK time every day, 7 p.m. Nigerian time as well. And that will be 2 p.m. Uh, in Eastern time, UK, America. So go fill the form against deception in the church and we'll see you tomorrow. Go, but tomorrow is not Friday, right? Tomorrow is Thursday. Yeah, so see you tomorrow. God bless you. Take care of yourself. Bye.